So this talk is one of several talks on representation theory, and it will be an introduction to representations of groups. So why, what is a representation of a group and why should we wish to find them? Well, a sort of, if you're really ambitious, what you might want to do is classify all symmetries of all mathematical objects. Obviously, that's a little bit overambitious, but let's see what happens. Well, first of all, you notice that the set of symmetries of a mathematical object is a group. So we can identify symmetries. This kind of corresponds to groups. So our problem splits into two problems. First, we could classify all groups. And secondly, given, given a group G, find all things that G acts on. Well, um, the first problem is obviously hopelessly impossible. There's no way we can classify all groups. We can't even classify all finite groups. Um, the second problem is essentially representation theory. So a thing that G acts on is called a representation of the group. So our problem is, suppose someone hands us a group. Um, we want to be able to find all possible representations. That's things the group acts on. So what sort of things can G act on? Well, it could act on any mathematical object, topological spaces or Lie algebras or whatever. But in representation theory, we're mostly interested in the following things. So G can act on, well, first of all, it can act on a set. And an action of G on a set is called a permutation representation. Um, in the early days of group theory, permutation representations were essentially the same as groups. A group was basically defined as a, as a set of permutations of some set, usually finite. Um, another thing a group can act on is modules over a ring. And this ring would quite often be a field. Um, and these are called linear representations. For fairly obvious reasons, their, their study is more or less linear algebra. Um, so the ring could be, it could be the integers or it could be a field. And if it's a field, it could be the complex numbers or it could be a field of characteristic P greater than zero. And representations over the integers and representations over fields of characteristic z greater than zero turn out to be rather complicated for reasons we'll discuss in a moment. But representations over the complex numbers of finite groups turn out to be rather well behaved. Um, so let's have a look at some examples of representations. So let's pick a group G and we will take G to be rotations of an icosahedron. So here is an icosahedron and we are going to look at all its rotations and you see it's got 20 faces and each face we can rotate three ways, so it has 60 symmetries. And let's find some representations of it. Well, first of all, we notice that it has 20 faces and it has 30 edges and it has 12 vertices. So these give us three permutation representations. And in general, if a group acts on a mathematical object, you can get lots of permutation representations by just looking at you know, points in the object it's acting on. Um, there are some more subtle ones. For example, the vertices all form pairs um, of opposite vertices. So we have six pairs of opposite vertices, which give six diagonals. So as well as acting on 12 vertices, it could act on six diagonals. So there are sometimes some less obvious permutation representations. Well, um, G also acts on three-dimensional real vector, uh, vector space because the icosahedron lives in R3, 
three-dimensional space, and any rotation of the icosahedron is just a linear transformation of R3. So we get a linear representation on, on three-dimensional real vector space. Um, as we'll see in a few lectures time, there are plenty of other actions of this group on real vector spaces. So how do we classify all representations? Well, we can first look at decomposable representations. So these are representations that can be split as two smaller representations. So if we've got a set S acted on by G, we might be able to write S as a union of S1 un union S2 with S1, S2 acted on by G. Um, if we've got a vector space V, we might be able to write V as a direct sum of V1 plus V2 with V1 and V2 acted on by G. And if the, the set S or the vector space can be split up like this, we say S or V is decomposable. Um, of course, there should be a non-trivial splitting. So we want S1, S2 not empty, and we want V1 and V2 not zero vector space. Um, so, um, so any set acted on by G is a union of indecomposable permutation representations. So um, when you're talking about indecomposable permutation representations, we usually call these transitive actions, which means that for any two points, there's an element of G taking one to the other. Um, and um, these sub-representations of S are, are often usually called the orbits of G on S, where two elements are in the same orbit if there's an element of G taking one to the other. So for permutation representations, it's pretty obvious how to split things up. We just split them up into transitive actions. And moreover, transitive actions are sort of easy to classify, that if G acts transitively on S, then S is more or less the same as G over H for a subgroup H of G. So this is just the set of cosets of H. And you can easily see that if you've got a subgroup, you get a transitive action. And conversely, if you've got a transitive action, then there's a subgroup or more precisely a conjugacy class of subgroups corresponding to it. So that sort of classifies all permutation representations, provided you can classify all subgroups of G. Um, however, Classifying all subgroups of a group turns out to be usually a hopelessly complicated problem, except in a few easy cases. So um, we can decompose permutation representations into e indecomposable ones. Um, can we do the same with uh, linear representations? Um, well, um, if the dimension of V is finite, we can decompose V as a direct sum, V1 plus V2 and so on, of indecomposable um, representations. That follows rather easily by induction on the dimension of vector space. If the dimension of V is infinite, things get really rather hairy. Um, first of all, if your vector space is infinite, you probably ought to be thinking about a topology on it, and you want to have these to be closed subspaces, otherwise you get into a real mess. Then you can get weird representations that you can just keep chopping them off into smaller and smaller pieces, and this process never comes to an end. So for infinite dimensional representations, you can't always decompose into indecomposable ones. We're going to avoid this problem just by sticking to finite dimensional representations. 
um, and we'll simplify further by usually talking about finite groups. Um, so we would like to classify all indecomposable representations. And let's do of a finite group on a finite dimensional vector space. Well, we still run into a problem. Um, this is the problem of the difference between indecomposable and irreducible representation. So V is called decomposable if V is equal to V1 plus V2 with V1 and V2, not zero. V is called um, reducible if V has a subspace V1 um, acted on by G. And of course, we take V1 not equal to zero and V1 not equal to the whole space V, otherwise it's kind of trivial. Um, and the problem is that it's obvious that um, decomposable spaces are reducible. So irreducible spaces, which are not reducible, are indecomposable. So irreducible implies indecomposable. Um, the trouble is the converse isn't always true. We can sometimes get indecomposable vector spaces that 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 aren't reducible. And the standard example is the following. We can take the group of reals acting on a two-dimensional space over R by the following matrices. We take the matrix 1, 1, x, 0. And this is reducible. It's got an obvious subspace consisting of the vectors not something which is um, mapped to itself by these, but it's indecomposable, which is fairly easy to check. If we call this subspace V1 and V2, then we see we have a rather bizarre phenomenon that G acts trivially on V1 and V2 over V1, meaning every element of G acts as the identity, but not on V2 itself, which is a bit bizarre. I mean, you thought that if a group acts trivially on a subspace and the quotient space, it should act trivially on the whole space, but here's a counterexample. Okay, well, you're gonna say this group is infinite, and I said I was gonna be talking only about finite groups, so this example is cheating a bit. OK, let's do an example for finite groups. This time I'm going to take G to be the cyclic group of order P. And I'm going to act on a two-dimensional vector space over the field of P elements. And it's going to act like this, where you can think of G as being the additive group of this finite field. And again, the same thing happens. Um, well, this is, a, this is a vector space over a field of characteristic greater than P sorry, greater than zero. So um, indecomposable and irreducible representations may be different for infinite groups, and they may be different if you're, even for finite groups, if the field has characteristic P. However, the key point is that for complex representations of a finite group, irreducible, is the same as indecomposable. And when this happens, representation theory becomes very much easier. Um, what it means is that all representations are what is known as completely reducible, meaning there are direct sum of irreducible representations. And the rule of thumb is that if your representations are irreducible, then life is easy. So this happens for complex representations of finite groups. It also happens for complex representations of compact groups and for unitary representations of more general objects. Um, in 
cases when you get um, in decomposable representations that are not irreducible, you're doing things like modular representation theory, which is, turns out to be much more complicated. Um, so we now have the problem, classify all irreducible representations of G, where we're gonna take this to be finite for the moment, and these to be complex representations. And let's start by looking at a very simple example, just to see what happens. Let's take G to be a group of order two, generated by one element G, with G squared equals one. And let's suppose G acts on V, which is a complex vector space. And it's really easy to figure out what G does to this. V just splits as V plus plus V minus, where here G acts as one, and here G acts as minus one. And that's because we can write any vector V as V plus GV over two plus V minus GV over two. And this is in V minus, and this is in V plus. So, Furthermore, V plus is, with, with G just acting as one, can be written as a sum of one-dimensional spaces. You can write it as one-dimensional spaces any way you like, and this will be, they will all be invariant under G. And similarly, V minus is also a sum of one-dimensional spaces. So every complex representation can be split up into a sum of one dimensional spaces, and there are only two of them. And we draw this by doing the character table of G. So the character table is a way of listing all representations of the group. And for the group of order two, the character table will look like this. First of all, we write out, well, you think we're writing out the elements. These aren't the elements, these are the conjugacy classes. But since G is abelian, we've only got two conjugacy classes, each with one element. Next, we write out the first representation by writing down its character. And this is a Greek letter chi, which is often used for a character. And the first character is going to be denoted by this. So, that, so this is a character of a one dimensional representation. And what is this character? Well, each entry here is the trace of the element on the representation V. Well, here V is just going to be, um, dimension of V is going to be one, and G is going to be one on V, so both one and G have trace one, so the character is just one and one. The other representation, let's call it chi two, um, is again one dimensional, so the element one is trace one, but now the element G acts as minus one, so it is trace minus one. So here's the character table of this little group of order two. So the rows are characters, one for each irreducible representation, and the columns correspond to conjugacy classes. And the entries just give the trace of some element of G on the corresponding representation. And you notice the trace only depends on the conjugacy class because trace of A, G, A to the minus one is equal to the trace of G. Of course, for this group of order two, that doesn't matter because it's abelian. But in general, the character table will, will look like this. So why do we use the trace in order to represent a representation? That I've never really quite understood. It's a sort of mysterious fact discovered by the early pioneers of representation theory like Frobenius, that giving the trace of every element is a really efficient and useful way of, of describing a representation. And we'll see a little bit later that 
you can re usually reconstruct the representation just knowing the trace of every element. So this is a really compact way to describe a representation. So we now have the problem, given a group G, how do we calculate its character table? Well, we've done this for a group of order two. Let's do something slightly more complicated. So let's take G to be the group S3, the symmetric group. on three letters, one, two, and three, which is order three factorial equals six. And let's write down its character table. And for this, we're going to use a combination of inspired guesswork and just plain cheating. So let's first of all, write down the conjugacy classes. So there's um, the conjugacy class. Well, first of all, there's the identity element. Next, there's a conjugacy class consisting of three transpositions. And finally, there's a conjugacy class consisting of the two three cycles. So our character table is going to have three columns. And let's find out its first representation. Well, that's really easy because we can just take the dimension of our vector space B1 and let G act trivially. And then every element has trace one. So this is the trivial character, which obviously every group has. Can we think of any other characters? Well, um, you remember every symmetric group has um, this, this notion of having even cycles and odd cycles. So there's a homomorphism from S3 to Z modulo 2Z, which takes even cycles to one or zero and odd cycles to um, element one in Z2. And this gives us an action on the complex numbers where even cycles go to one and odd ones go to minus one. So that we, we've got a one dimensional representation and even cycles, which are that one and that one of trace one and odd cycles of trace minus one. Um, can we think of any other representations? Well, Yes, there's another one because G acts on um, C3. You see it acts on three points. We can just take a basis consisting of three elements, X1, X2, and X3, with G permuting these three basis elements. Or if you want to write it in coordinates, it's just permuting the coordinates. And that gives us a representation. And what is its character? Well, we need to work out the trace of each element on this. And the trace of one is three. I'm going to write it in green for a reason you'll see in a moment. And the trace of any other element, if you think about it, is just the number of points fixed by that element. Because, for example, a transposition will have a matrix that looks like this. And a three cycle will have a matrix that looks like this, and that has trace zero because it's got no fixed points, and that has trace one because it has fixed points. So I get three, one, zero as my character. And next we ask, is this irreducible? And the answer is no, because this splits as a sum of two um, representations. So first of all, you can have a sub-representation with x1 equals x2 equals x3, and you can see that's just the same as the trivial one dimensional representation. It's got another representation given by x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals zero. So this actually splits as the sum of something two dimensional and something one dimensional. And we can work out the trace of the two dimensional bit by subtracting the trivial representation from this. So we get our representation chi three, which looks like two zero minus one. So here is our character table, except we should cross out this green bit because it was just sort of scaffolding that we were using to work out this representation. And this character table has a lot of, lot of properties. First of all, we notice the columns are orthogonal, as you can easily check. Next, you notice the rows are orthogonal. 
Well, you may be a bit suspicious about this because if you look carefully at the rows, you can see that strictly speaking, they are not orthogonal. I mean, one times one plus one times minus one plus one times one is certainly not zero. So what on earth do I mean? Well, that's because you've got to weight them by the sum, by the number of elements in each conjugacy class. So we weight by size of the conjugacy class. Um, if you like, you can think when, when you work out whether these two rows are orthogonal, you shouldn't be summing over conjugacy classes. You should be summing over all elements of G. So, so you have to sum three times for this. Now we find one times one minus three times these two plus two times that two is indeed zero. So the rows are orthogonal. And you see also that all the rows have norm equal to the order of G, where the norm means the inner product of a row with itself, again, weighting by the conjugacy class. Um, you notice the columns also have um, a norm, and the norm of the column is the order of a group divided by the number of elements in each conjugacy class. So that here's a conjugacy class of three elements. So the order of G over three is two, which is one squared plus minus one squared. So there are lots and lots of orthogonality relations. Um, you also notice that the character table is square. So I'm going to kind of cheat by um, just announcing that this is all the characters there are. Um, and um, so in, in general for a group, you can describe all the representations by just writing down the character table. So this is what the character table of a rather easy small group looks like. What does the character table of a really big group look like? Well, I've got an example here. We can look at the character table of the monster group, which is order about 10 to 54. And if you look in the, um, let's see if I can switch to, um, not presenting. So here, um, if I hold this up, you can see a small piece of the character table of the monster. The monster actually takes eight pages like this, not just two. Um, so it's got about 40,000 entries, um, but that's a lot more efficient than trying to write out the multiplication table of the monster, which has um, so many entries that it wouldn't fit into the visible universe if you tried writing it out. Um, so I can show you a small piece of the monster character table in more detail. So if you look at this, um, you can see the top left-hand corner of the monster character table. And if I zoom in a bit, um, you can see the first column. So there's the order of the monster. Um, and these are the first entries, which are the trace of the identity element on the representation. So you can see that the first non-trivial representation is dimension 196883, and the next one is even worse, and so on. Um, so that's what a really big character table looks like. Um, so um, um, I just finish by answering the question, what is the point of finding representations of a group? Um, well, the answer is that um, using representation theory, you can give quite easy proofs of things that would otherwise be extraordinarily difficult to prove. For example, we have the Burnside P to the A, Q to the B theorem. So what does this say? It says that a group of order P to the A, Q to the B is solvable. In particular, it can't be simple. Here, P and Q are, of course, primes. And this was originally proved by Burnside using representation theory. And the representation theory proof is amazingly short. And it looks like a piece of black magic. Um, you do these slightly bizarre calculations with characters of groups using a little bit of modular arithmetic. And the fact that a group of order P to the A, Q to the B just sort of drops out for some mysterious reason. 
Um, there are proofs of this without using um, representation theory, but they are incredibly difficult and no proofs were found for many decades after Burnside found his proof using representation theory. Um, incidentally, the smallest order of a non-solvable group is 60, which is two squared times three times five, which you see is divisible by three different primes. So um, Burnside's theorem only works for two primes and definitely can't be extended to three primes. Okay, that's the end of the introductory lecture. The next lecture will be on representations of abelian groups, which is the easiest case.